Hello and welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. This is Minnie Ingersoll, host of the podcast and partner at 10110. 10110 is a seed stage venture fund here in LA. All opinions expressed on this show by me and my guests are solely our own. You may be able to hear a little bit of harp music in the background. She's doing her harp lesson via Zoom in the other room. Um, when she was seven, when they were seven, we told them they were going to learn instruments. And we said, what instrument do you want to play? And one of them said drums. And we're like, cool. And the other one said harp. And I said, <laughs> what's your second choice? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. So we're recording. I'm going to go ahead and read an introduction. Oh my God, we're recording. <laughs> okay. Oh. Jim Andelman is a pillar of the Southern California venture ecosystem. Along with Mark Mullen, he is one of the founding partners of one of our favorite B2B funds, Bonfire Ventures. Before that, Jim was managing partner at Rincon Ventures. He has guided many startups through their early stages and a few early stage VC firms as well. My sometimes co-host David is here as well, and I know he would also express appreciation, Jim, for your pillar-like support of this ecosystem. Thanks so much for having me. I would add your, your pillar-like support for me. Um, I, I told Minnie earlier that you were my VC whisperer because when I was just starting out, uh, you had already been doing it for, I don't know, over 10 years. Um, it's, great to see, uh, it's great to see you evolve and uh, your funds evolve, and I, I'm really excited about your new fund. Can you tell us about it? Uh, sure. Like the latest fund, we just recently announced uh, Bonfire 2, uh, yeah. which is our second core fund under that brand. Uh, it is a $100 million fund, um, uh, doing the same thing we've been always doing, uh, which is leading seed rounds in B2B software startups. Uh, we do have an expanded team. Bonfire started with just uh, Mark and me, as many mentioned. Uh, we added a venture partner who is now a full-time equal partner named Brett Queener, uh, who has wonderful operating experience. Uh, and we now have two additional members of the investment team, uh, Tyler Churchill, who's been with us over a year, uh, as well as uh, Jen Richard, who just joined us last week. Mazel tov. Thank you very much. It is, so, uh, we're, 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 we're empire building. I've never expected it. Do you think you really are empire building? Uh, I really like our, uh, stage and investment style. I like our playbook. I like our recipe, whatever, you know, whatever analogy you want to use. And, you know, there can be a tendency as you raise larger funds, right. To experience what's called style drift, right. You either need to write larger checks or you need to do a lot more and follow on at later stages, or you need to do a lot more companies. Right. And, and all of those things um, present challenges uh, mm. to, to your, your way of doing it. So, so, you know, while 60 to 100 seems like a big jump, we've also went from an investment team of two to five in that time frame. So if you just think of the three partners, uh, a, a good way to, to sort of evaluate a a fund and what it needs to deploy is capital per partner per fund. And Bonfire, even though it's on fund two, is really a merger of the two predecessor funds. I founded and ran Rincon Venture Partners. Mark founded and ran Double M. Uh, we were two of the uh, very small number of B2B specialists at Seed in Southern California. We do lead most of the rounds in which, in which when we are entering a company, when we are making our initial investment. Let me ask about that for a second, because we just had um, Mark Terbeek on the podcast and he actually used the word indifferent um, when describing whether they lead or don't lead. Mm -hmm. um, why? And I think that Mark Mullen, when he was on our podcast, said that you guys lead 80 percent of the time. Our pitch is expertise, attentiveness, responsiveness, right? You can't be a really high volume investor and have enough time to to deliver on that brand promise. Uh, and so relative to the universe of seed firms, we are a lower pace, lower volume, higher conviction, higher involvement investor. I had been told my back of the envelope was something like take the fund size and divide by 50 and that's what size check the fund wants to write. This is when I was an entrepreneur. I'm, it wasn't a very sophisticated formula. Does that apply for you guys? It's not, it's not far off. Uh, the, you know, with, think about a $100 million fund, 
That means uh, if, if we're targeting 25 companies, that means the average is 4 million per company. Uh, and, um, you know, our model for this fund is 40% initial check, 60% reserved for follow on. So that's, you know, uh, for every dollar we invest initially, we reserve $1.50 for, uh, for follow on. And so that suggests something like a $1.75 million initial check on average. So you're pretty darn close. For the reserve, how, how much of that reserve do you think about is to just pour into your companies that are cranking versus to sort of help companies that need your support in their next round? Um, it's a great question. And there are different philosophies, Tom. It's never automatic. It's pretty automatic if you get a new outside lead. Um, right. Then, then we're, then we're, um, it's very rare that we don't do our pro rata. Um, the, you know, the challenging parts and the hardest part about this business, right. Is to, is when you make the tough call, uh, to, um, not provide more money to an existing portfolio company. And, and that I, in my opinion, that's the hardest part of this job. And if no one else shows up with any money and the company needs money and then it's sort of life or death is in our hands, that's a, that's a situation we hate to be in. Um, uh, but it is our job to deploy every dollar to its highest and best use. Um, Let's talk about the other side of that because um, I'm curious, for a company that's, that's sort of obviously on a good trajectory and the mm -hmm. rounds, you know, there are rounds that get quite expensive and your, you know, your million dollars buys a lot less uh, and, uh, you know, as a percentage of what you hold, it's, you're maybe not hanging on to that much. When do you decide that it's better to take a new shot on goal versus continuing to fund a, a company that's doing great? Yeah, it is a, it is a great question. And, and there are wonderful, you know, examples that are in direct conflict with one another. Um, you know, one of our greatest successes, um, Mark invested in a company called the Trade Desk at Seed. Um, and, you know, now it is, uh, last I checked, it was an $18 billion public company. Um, you know, the, the initial valuation, I think, was around $12 million. Um, in retrospect, if every single dollar in that fund had, we just used it for follow-ons at Trade Desk, like, that would have been a better deployment of every single one of those dollars. But there's no way you know that at the time. Um, and that's one of the things that I think that the idea of sort of lean into your winners is, um, you know, in my opinion, a little bit of um, revisionist history or false narrative, because every deal when it happens is a market deal. Um, right. and, and, and you can almost only tell in, in, in retrospect, because you're absolutely right that, that incremental million dollars can get us, in, you know, an extra quarter of a percent in some company, or it can get us another, you know, 10% in a new company. Venture is, as we all know, venture is hard to scale uh, because it's much easier to add portfolio companies than it is to exit them. So you tend to accumulate them. Um, and just because companies are pretty far along doesn't mean they don't need your time and attention. Right. Um, and, you know, there is a model as well with seed funds to sort of, pass the baton, right? So you're active, you know, until series A and then you drop off the board and then it's like, call me when you need me. Um, that does happen with us usually around series B, right? Because there's a logical limit to the number of VCs that are helpful on a board. <laughs> um, and uh, people can debate whether that number is greater it's than usually, it's, it's N minus one, at least. In this whole retrospect, it's all 2020. Um, what have been some big surprises or sort of, uh, as David would call them, the wild roller coasters that you've had? Um, uh, let's see, Archer's a good example. So Archer started as Campus Explorer. It was consumer destination for, you know, discovery around post-secondary education. Um, and um, really capable team business did really well. They, I led, I think a million and a half dollar seed round in 2007 and the company got profitable with that. Uh, and, um, and then did a, a series a wanted to continue to invest and then did a series B and early on 90% of their business was, was, was at their owned and operated websites. 
uh, and they had a small little sort of powered by um, business where they would help other publishers monetize. Um, and, you know, sort of Google kind of declared jihad on that whole lead gen um, um, category, all the comparison shopping engines and businesses like this one. So this business managed to, with no new capital, last time they raised capital was 2013, uh, managed to continue to grow despite the fact that 95% of their consumer facing business went away. So they, they managed to very successfully transition to an entirely B2B business. And uh, I give the team tremendous credit for, for seeing what was happening and, and, uh, and putting themselves in the, in the position to, to make it happen and sticking with it when it was hard um, and, uh, and when there were, you know, when there were a lot of other sort of ways they could have decided to spend the next five or 10 years of their careers. Um, and now it's going to be a great, be a great outcome for everyone. So that's, that's one example. I feel like we see those sometimes in pitches and, uh, David, I feel like you particularly don't like this where someone says, well, we're doing X, but it's gonna let us build up our data mode, or it's gonna let us build this other thing, this, and, um, and I think we're always very skeptical when that's part of the pitch, but I think you see it in, in the wild a lot more. But to be clear, this was not part of the pitch, but I agree with you. There, if, we, if we all had a dollar for every startup that pitched us, well, we're doing, but we're going to make money on the data. Right. Uh, this is going to, you know, that's going to be the main event. Um, the, you know, we wouldn't actually have to invest. We could just harvest those dollars. One thing you said to me about um, your portfolio and how you're sort of thinking of constructing this you, you talked something about like diamonds in the rough versus sort of your fairway investments. How do you, how do you think about, you know, what's in the, is it fairway? I don't golf. I just made that up. But how do you think <laughs> about what's in the fairway versus what are the, what are the more diamonds in the rough, whatever the, the correct analogy is? Um, you know, there is a, um, you know, there's, there's a typical founder profile in BC right? There's a whole universe of other founders, right? That don't have that kind of background. And the challenge is that founder may be less good at raising money because they don't know what the VC wants to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't mean they aren't building a venture scale business. Um, I, I'm, uh, you know, we are, we get very involved in helping our companies raise series A. Uh, we have, we have kind of productized that, um, uh, that form of value add, uh, and for founders who, who, who let us, who want us to, and it is most of them, um, we kind of co-project manage the Series A fundraise with them. Um, you know, we deliver to them a, a, a Google Doc that is tailored to them that has all of the, uh, the you know, the, the B2B software Series A lead investors and with named partners and responsibility, you know, from the Bonfire team of who's going to make that introduction and and, uh, and, you know, we use that as sort of the CRM through the process with those founders. Um, Long-winded way of saying, like, we're on, the, we're on the fundraising side more often, you know, we're on the, we're on the sell side more often than we're on the buy side, if you will, uh, because our entry point into a company happens once, and that company typically goes on to raise multiple follow-on rounds. And so, you know, one of the things we hear uh, about maybe these sort of less typical founders is, gosh, I'm not sure they're building a venture scale business, which drives me nuts sometimes. Cause it's like, well, maybe they are building a venture scale business, but they just don't talk about it the way that you want them to talk about it. Um, and uh, so part of that is our job to help, you know, train that founder to talk VC speak, right. And avoid the, um, the, um, the negative triggers, if you will. Can you go back a little bit, talk about this productization of the uh, of financing like do you how how early does that start like you know a lot of planning goes into yeah i mean I, and i'll give a lot of credit to um to my partner brett uh queener on this one so brett is a career um SaaS operator uh 22 years as an exec at, at software companies more than a decade at salesforce uh, reporting directly to mark benioff really still maintains that operator's lens um and, uh, and has, has really helped us and pushed us to operationalize more of what we do. Um, the, and so, 
you know, it was a recurring thing where we were, you know, developing lists of firms that we wanted to introduce them to. And it was a recurring thing that we would help a company with their operating plan. It was a recurring thing that we would help a company with what should be in a data room. And so, you know, we just started taking, taking ones that we thought were most generalizable and creating templates out of those. So it's not cookie cutter. Every deck doesn't look the same by any means. Part of a deck is not just checking all the boxes and including everything that, a, that a, an investor wants to hear, but it's crafting a narrative that highlights the unique strengths of that business and what makes it so compelling and why you should join us uh, with conviction around the odds of this company's success. David said that you have strong opinions on sort of the governance side of things. Um, but I'm not sure where that comes from, you know, whether that's board governance or rights that investors should have when you're writing term sheets. Um, there are a bunch of things that go into the broad category of governance. Um, and, uh, the, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's around, you know, how decisions get made, how, you know, how certain decisions get made. And, and sometimes it's just around oversight and making sure that, um, uh, that the company is getting the, you know, the best guidance that's available around the table. Um, so part of that is, you know, what's in financing docs. Uh, and part of that is um, more, pra you know, more in practice, less, less mandated and more just um, uh, the manner in which we work together, right? What is, the, what is a board cadence? What's in a, who, who attends board meetings? What's covered in a board meeting? That, that type, type of stuff. Staying on being a good VC. I think you've been a, a, a VC for 20 years now, Jim. <laughs> I think. Yes, yeah, started with <laughs> seven Yes, that's what it said. I mean, that was just your LinkedIn. Um, said that yeah, to me. So I started, I started, I led software investing for a Bay Area VC firm called Robview Capital Partners in 1999. And I've been a VC pretty much since. Right. Um, that's awesome. So where do you think, um, you know, you were giving, you were talking some about it, but where do you think newer VCs, what do you think people are getting wrong today in venture? What, what advice do you have for people who may be newer in their career and their venture career? Yeah, um, it's a great question, right? We are, um, despite the fact that we're in a pandemic and a recession, um, you know, my, you know, again, as, as, as for context, like I do B2B software, I only do B2B software. I'm not, I'm, the, as every day passes that I get more and more focused on B2B software, I get less and less capable of talking about everything else. Um, so in the world of B2B software, Right, we are seeing all-time highs on um, public market valuations, uh, right? And like, oh, there was a five percent correction. Well, that means that these companies are be only only trading at nineteen times revenue instead of twenty. Awesome. Um, <laughs> right. So um, most, it seems that most practicing VCs, right, have only been practicing VCs in a bull market. Um, and it's it's really instructive. I love that. Um, uh, uh, Bessemer released some of their investment memos. You can go to bvp.com slash memo, I think it is. And, you know, you look at, you look at the, one of them that's near and dear to my heart is because it's a, certainly one of my anti-portfolio is a company called MindBody, uh, which is a Southern California company uh, that, uh, that made uh, uh, vertical software for yoga and Pilates studios. But uh, Bessemer invested, I think, in 2010. And their investment memo you can go and read and uh i think they invested at about four times arr uh same thing shopify about four times four and a half times arr and like that is unheard of today right and so you know we we made an investment in a company um just in december and you know they were doing about uh 300k in arr and our valuation was a uh, you know 10ish million pre money valuation and um, which is sort of in the range of where things are these days i worry right that there are that there are so many participants at the seed stage that um, uh, people that don't have historical context uh, that um, that uh, you know it's good for founders i guess 
Um, maybe bad for founders if they have valuations that then it's hard for them to support in subsequent rounds. Um, and I've seen that happen certainly as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I do, it is a, it is a, I think an ongoing question for those who have been in this business as long as we have, like what is a fair price and what is the right price based in, based on today's realities. I think it's also been easy for, um, um, seed round participants who are not lead investors to um, not have to pay attention and have, and there have been no con no negative consequences to it. Uh, and again, when there are market corrections, um, it's much harder to, um, to know what's going on and know what the right decisions to make are um, when you, when you haven't been paying attention all along the way. So playing that backwards even more or upstream even more. So, it, you know, everyone's raising a seed fund or everyone in, in undergrad wants to be an entrepreneur. You know, what do you think about that? Like, do, would you coach your daughters to be entrepreneurs? So two very different things. You know, should I coach some, do I coach someone, should they be a VC or do I coach someone, should they enter the startup ecosystem? On the, on the latter question, you know, my answer is hell yeah. I mean, like, I don't think the, the trade-off used to be, well, you could go to a more established company, you could be a banker or a consultant or work for a, you know, a Fortune 500 company, or you could take a lot more risk with your career and get paid less and do a startup. And like, now that's sort of, that trade-off doesn't really exist. Like, those, those, those tradition, more traditional careers aren't necessarily more stable. Um, and those startup careers don't necessarily pay less. And so why wouldn't you want to work in a more dynamic environment? Why wouldn't you want to work in an environment where you have so much more opportunity to learn? Why wouldn't you want to work in an environment where there's that equity component? But then shouldn't there be all these new VCs to support those entrepreneurs? Shouldn't this, are we just at the start of the flywheel going? You know, totally maybe, right? I mean, <laughs> So, so that's, that's, one, that's, that's the flip side to these increasing valuations. You look at that, um, those investment memos for MindBody and Shopify, and they had exit scenarios in there. And like the high of the exit value scenario, the, like the, the moon sh over the moon success, success case for MindBody was a $400 million exit, and it exited for $1.9 billion. The over the moon success case for Shopify was 1 billion and it's currently worth 113 billion. So if the exit values are 100x what we thought they were going to be, well gosh, maybe it's okay to pay 5x what we, you know, what we think is a fair price or you know, 3x or 2x what we think is a fair price at seed. So what we're doing today, right, from a dollar perspective is similar is is seed, right? It's typically like a 3 million dollar round. Uh, but from a business progress perspective, not even 10 years ago, the majority of Series A financings were pre-revenue. And so that is a, that is a fundamental shift, right? Um, there's a firm called Wing VC that is ex, uh, mostly ex Excel and Sequoia Partners that, um, that published a really, some really good data around the, the shift in the Series A landscape. And they looked at all companies that had ever received money from one of, you know, 22 VC firms that they deemed top, top tier. And, you know, that's not just three. That's not just, you know, Sequoia, Excel, Benchmark, Andreessen. And they found that the average Series A from firms, you know, uh, of companies that have taken money from those types of firms is right now sitting at 15 million raised, not valuation, raised. And that's up from five. Uh, and so the average round size gone up from five to 15, the average amount of capital that has gone into one of those companies before series a has gone up from 1.8 to 4.6. And I may not be getting these numbers exactly right, but they're in the ballpark. Um, so they've raised 4.6 before they do their series a, before they do their series, yeah. a, right? So there's a, you know, there's a convertible, there's another convertible, yeah. then there's a series seed, and then maybe there's a series C1 or Series C prime. And, and on average, there are about four financing events before Series A. Some of it is nice that, that it, it, it 
in a prior era when the venture when the venture community was smaller, you know, you didn't have the luxury of raising a two million dollar runway extender with a new investor. Um, those just didn't exist, right? If you weren't ready for um, for Trinity or Mayfield to give you, you know, or CRV or any of those firms that are on, you know, their their NEA, their that are in Roman numeral, you know, um, uh, 10 plus, uh, if you weren't ready for their next check, you were like, shit out of luck. The flip side of the, the very same coin, right, that you can do more with less and that, and that, uh, that, that startup formation and launch and growth in the early stages has, uh, requires less capital, is that there are so many more competitors in every market that's worth mm. pursuing. And more and more enterprise value is being concentrated a smaller and smaller number of winners in each category. So the implication there, though, is that you're not looking at it with a lens of, is this a good idea? You're saying, is this going to be the category winner? I mean, you, the VC, has to think that. Um, We, the VC, I'll speak for us. We, the VC, have to believe that the business that we are choosing to invest in at Seed has a credible shot at category leadership. Okay, Jim, so you can't be a VC now and you have to go start a new endeavor. What would you go and start? And if you can't tell me exactly, like where would you focus? So one of the things I really like about VC is there is like the benchmark style where you, you don't have a pyramid, right? You have, very, you have zero to very few junior members of your investment team. And, you know, your job, you're the doer. Like, you know, I like the, you know, running the fingers through the dirt and doing my own analysis and all that stuff. I'm a shitty delegator. Um, I know that about myself, which is why i this is a good fit for me. Um, and maybe an operating role, building a startup wouldn't be as good a fit for me. Um, and so back to your earlier question, like around advice, you know, I think if you have the, the capability to be a startup founder or a startup operator, that might be a more rewarding job than being a VC where you are a coach, not a player, right? Mm. You're not, not, you're not out on the field. You're, you know, you're on the sidelines giving advice and suggesting plays. Um, and um, I think that, you know, when you're a startup operator, the, the lows are lower, but the highs are higher, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you, you live a life more brightly, right? Perhaps uh, burning more brightly to, to extend our bonfire analogy here. Um, and that's a little muted as a VC. Um, and, you know, y- y- you two have both lived that, both sides. I laugh at VC fund founders who say, oh, I'm a startup founder just like you because, you know, you're not, you're never living paycheck to paycheck as a VC. We're yeah. also, we're small businesses, right? I mean, you have a few people, your revenues are measured in small business kind of numbers. Like, it's a different thing. We're not VC scale. <laughs> so I didn't answer your question. I think, you know, I, I have been enticed once or twice by really um, phenomenal teams that I've worked with that I just like look forward to seeing their caller ID or like getting an email from them. And, and the folks that I have been in the trenches with, if you will, working through specific issues, mostly around M and A and financing. And I have been enticed to, you know, think about switching to an operating role. Well, I'm not trying to talk you out of doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job at Bonfire. We appreciate having you in the ecosystem. (laughs) <laughs> it's the last job of my career. And when Mark and I partnered up, you know, it was very consciously like, you know, these are, these are harder partnerships to disentangle yourself from than a marriage. Yeah, that's great. You're married to, to Mark Mullen and Brett Cleaner. Um, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations they're, they're on totally, that. They're totally my business wives. They are indeed. <laughs> that's great. Well, congratulations on that. Congratulations to you all on this um, new fund. Um, And thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks so much for having me.